Till, and I play guitar and sing in Neurosis. Uh, my name is Sebastian, and of course I play in Kellermensch, and they've asked uh, me uh, to perform this interview because we uh, have um, kind of seen your band as a, both a source of inspiration, but also of your career as kind of a, a role model career. So I'm very happy that you're here, but can you tell me, have you played at Roskilde Festival before, and if so, when? No, we've never played Roskilde yeah. before, no. Okay. We've been to Denmark many times in, in the past, but never Roskilde. Your band started in Oakland, California in 1985, right? Yeah. Okay. And um, uh, I'd like to hear something about what were your ambitions uh, when you started? Did you predict the way your career has evolved? There's no way to predict the way a career will evolve, but there was, there was a certain, uh, there was a mindset, you know, and that was to deliver intense, emotional uh, music that pushed the musical boundaries and pushed ourselves to open our minds and to open ourselves up to new sounds and, uh, and to take it as far as it would. I mean, when we started, we were very young, very young, you know, and it was a lot of just, uh, you know, teenage angst and whatnot, but we had a we had a bigger psychic vision of where it would be. We knew that we would incorporate other sounds. We knew that we would figure out how to play our instruments enough to be able to play what we were hearing in our heads, you know, and that we wanted to branch out and uh, it, it seems cliche now because we live in the age of multimedia, but back when we started and we first started experimenting with visuals live, you know, it, it wasn't something that was done very often in our scene. I mean, you know, maybe in the 60s in San Francisco you had psychedelic, yeah. Pink Floyd had psychedelic visuals, but you know, for us it was uh, just different ways to make it as, as emotionally intense as possible and to try to bring everybody that was witnessing it uh, into the feeling and into the mood because it's very personal music we don't make this music for fans or for other people or it's we make this music as I'm sure you know because you're a musician we make it because it's inside and we have to and if we didn't have this outlet uh, some part of our soul would probably die you know, or come out in a bad way you know so this is a way to focus all these energies into something that's ultimately positive you know as you've kind of insinuated also, your music is hard to describe using genres. So uh, was this important to you when you began making music? Originality was important. I mean, genre names come and go, you know? I mean, when we started in 85, you know, people would try to put us in, oh, you're a hardcore band, and you know, and it just keeps changing and changing yeah. and changing, and all those things come and go, and ultimately in time mean nothing. The only thing that means something is, did your music touch people? There are many bands out there now, also important bands, who uh, list you as a source of inspiration. And um, uh, bands like Tool and Melvins uh, are often heard uh, in relation with Neurosis. And so I'd like to hear a little about, are there any bands out there that you feel a uh, connection to, or is it solely a personal thing, or do you feel like you have kindred spirits on the music scene? Yeah, there's definitely kindred spirits, and they come in different forms, you know. I mean, uh, when you are a touring band, you know, you meet people on the road, and you have a certain, uh, there's like a brotherhood of people that are out there sacrificing their lives to go make music, you know. Like you asked earlier, what was going on? I mean, when we started, we there were certain bands that were role models to us, like uh, um, Black Sabbath, Pink Floyd, Black Flag, uh, Killing Joke, Joy Division, uh, bands that did their own thing, seemingly out of nowhere. You know, they had they had nothing. Uh, they had no scene they were a part of that you could pick the musical influence out. They were doing something new and original, and. Um, and so we took that to heart, you know, uh, and also coming from a kind of DIY musical background, you know, in the Bay Area in the 80s, it, it uh, was taking all those things and going with it. And so if we have an influence on another band, uh, we would hope that it wouldn't be necessarily a, a musical one, but that it would be an attitude one and that they would go carve their own path, carve their own sound, and do it totally from the heart. How 
very cool. And um, I think also uh, when I hear your music, it seems very album oriented. Like album is the uh, media of choice for your band. Is this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, we always view each album as a almost a single piece with different movements within it. it you know, because each album expresses a certain time period for us. And um, we're not very song oriented, you know, we don't write hit songs or popular songs or, <laughs> you know, anything like that. And so it, it's about a flow. It's about taking ourselves on a journey from beginning to end through something that feels complete and has dynamics and has, uh, you know, it feels like a natural cycle of something like the weather or like, you know, the cycle of the year or the cycle of a life, you know, it all has to go with that kind of spiraling nature of things. Talking about the album media, it seems the uh, digital revolution has sort of uh, removed the monopoly of albums uh, as a uh, fixed medium for bands. How do you see this, uh, being an album-oriented band, how do you see this evolution as worrying or do you embrace it? Well, it's hard because I'm, gonna, I'm older, you know, and I, I don't relate to the... I mean, I like to have my iPod full of all my music, but really still I like to be at home and put on a record and look at the album artwork and read the lyrics and look at the credits and meditate on it. I mean, that's still the way I prefer to experience something, but I realize the younger generation has grown up on something completely different and doesn't necessarily view it that way. So I guess, you know, we have to evolve and somehow exist within it or, you know, but ultimately we'll keep doing our art, what we do. We'll keep releasing albums and if people want to nitpick little pieces out of them, then actually they'll be missing something and they won't get the full impact. There's a tendency for um, a, a kind of a DIY tendency to the internet, uh, which I suppose that you would uh, see as uh, liberating. I like from a independence standpoint, I like that any band, any young person can go buy recording gear, make a pretty decent sounding record, uh, and put it up on a uh, place where potentially millions of people can see it, you know? Like when I was younger, I used to t uh, trade tapes with people from all over the world, you know, like one of the things I'm, like strange Scandinavian hardcore, for example, mm. you know, back then it was extremely hard to find. Record shops didn't mm. carry it. You had to trade a tape of it, some, some American thing you had with somebody in Sweden or in Norway for that tape, you know, and uh, now you just get on the internet, type it in, and you, within 30 seconds you found it. Somebody, somebody has uploaded it on their blog site or whatever. And it, <laughs> so that, that, that's kind of interesting. Let me just finish off by saying I'm very much looking forward to seeing your band perform uh, today and uh, I've waited a lot of years. How, how have things been on your tour and are you, are you excited? Or has it been rough? Uh, you know, no complaints, man. You know, I mean, not many people get to do this, you know. Tired, you know, too much travel and whatnot, but that, that's petty, you know. Most you know, we get to go home and go back to our jobs and tell people that we work with that, hey, you know, what did you do over the summer? Well, we got, we got to travel in Europe and play in our band, you know, that's pretty cool.